So friends and comrades, I'm really happy to be here, but although this is a very beautiful theatre, it's completely dysfunctional from the point of view of any kind of interaction, any open theatre. If, the, if there are actors and directors here, please, please apply some of the principles of this event to redesigning theatres so there can be some communication, because honestly I can't these... I see you with the light. Yeah, the... Uh, you're black. The floodlights, the floodlights are kind of... You don't want to see our, you know, exactly what expressions we've got. You know, would, you, would you like to reserve? But, but, but they can't dim them, or anyway, let's get on with it. Okay, so... Yeah, the microphone closer. Is this okay? Oh, okay. We just press the button. Okay, no, I think it's pressed, but... So... Okay. I just thought standing up, I've got more of a chance of seeing you. Um, so I, I'm, my contribution is very much in the spirit of Massimiliano's description of this event as a laboratory. And I'm very much presenting kind of thinking in progress, very much inspired by the contributions here and by collaborative work, particularly with Leo and, uh, and uh, Michaelis and other people in Greece. Uh, and I, I think one thing there that I'm impressed by and why it's so, so um, stimulating to be here and so kind of um, encouraging from the point of view of any sort of collaborative work on alternatives is that the way that, um, that particularly Syriza members and ex-Syriza members are responding to the, the defeat. I mean, it has been a defeat, just like in Britain we had to face the fact that we had been defeated by by Thatcher. That didn't mean we stopped and gave up, but in a way, defeat and failure can be a source of really rich kind of lessons, and I think that's the spirit in which we've got to be responding to the situation um, in Greece. At the moment, I'm particularly thinking, I mean, the whole issue of the relationship between movements and parties, between movements and struggles in society, and political institutions, you know, it's, a long, it's got a long history. But I think that we need to go, certainly experiences in Britain and experiences here in Greece has made me think we've just got to go a lot deeper than some of the old metaphors of a voice, you know, the party being a voice of the movement and, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, and so that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, in Britain, I feel particularly challenged because we faced, as, as other people have talked about and written about here, um, a most extraordinary situation where the most radical MP, Labour MP in the British Parliament, who's disobeyed party orders almost every day, it's like his breakfast, you know, he, he, he's never really obeyed the party leadership, um, and who's always been somebody who's stood up for social movements, for social struggles. Everybody involved in movements and struggles knows they can go to Jeremy Corbyn in Parliament. And it's Suddenly, you know, in a way, mm. Mm. I'm going too fast. Am I going too fast? Oh, okay. 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 Yes. No, apologies to the translators because like one or two others, I haven't got a script. So I'll, if I'm, I'll occasionally look at you and if I'm going too slow, look too fast, just go like this. Okay. Okay. So, um, so here we've got this situation where, uh, this MP, this radical MP, got onto the ballot paper only just and totally reluctantly. You know, he's a reluctant leader, which is probably possibly a good thing. Um, and and yet, you know, he's won not only won over 60% of the the vote, but he's mobilised people. He had rallies where people were climbing in, young people mainly climbing in at the windows to to come, and 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 you know, it's led to around, uh, in total, 500,000 people, 300,000 new people becoming voters. It was actually the result of a sort of uh, a unintended result of a change in the rules of the Labour Party to originally to destroy the power of the unions, a sort of Tony Blair change. But actually, it led to individuals being able to vote. And there's such, as, as in most parts of Europe, there's such deep and sort of accumulated anger about the inequalities, the consequences of austerity, the distance and unresponsiveness of politicians who've come from a, a rich and, and, and privileged class. You know, there's such anger that they, people were just like a pressure cooker, were just waiting for a voice, and here was this voice. And now, you know, now he's leader of the Labour Party, but a bit like, you know, Syriza being in office, not in power in terms of the state, 
Similarly, he's in office in the Labour Party, but not really in terms of power. His one power is this democratic mandate and this movement. It's undoubtedly a movement in terms of the kind of people who've been attracted to it. So now there's, there's a lot of debate, which I think is very revealing for our discussions, about you know, what, how, how is this movement, all these new people who've joined the Labour Party or become supporters of the Labour Party, how is that to be to be mobilized as a source of power? How is it to be realized and become a sort of force? And the debate, in a way, it was expressed well at a Socialist Register panel the other day when one of the key people who organized Jeremy's campaign and is now, in a way, one of the officials leading this movement, but his phrase for the relationship between the movement and the party is, um, we will mobilize them, you know, which seemed to me the sort of classic mentality of, you know, okay, lots of new people, that means lots of new voters, lots of new supporters, and we will turn them into supporters for the party. No, no sense that they have a sort of creative capacity, a creative transformative capacity. And I think we saw an, a similar but more complicated uh, problem um, in this sort of... Um, predominance of electoral politics over, over transformative politics. In the uh, key year, or two years between uh, Syriza's um, you know, huge rise to being a party of potential government in 2011 to its final election, and I haven't studied this, and it's a, an experience that needs really detailed study, but what many people say to me is in that period, the emphasis was more and more on how do we turn our relationship with social movements, you know, from being a relationship mainly of us being part of the movements, Syriza being part of the movements, supporting the movements, to, to those activists becoming part of the electoral machine uh, or the electoral process of getting Syriza elected. It's the same process happening now in Spain where Pablo Iglesias talk about, talks about Podemos being an electoral machine from all that movement in the squares, we now have the aspiration towards an electoral machine. And so I, was, I sort of was trying to puzzle out what, what can be done about this. You know, I go to meetings of the Jeremy Corbyn sort of movement and feel, you know, where is the, you know, all the young people that joined the Corbyn campaign are people who, who in a way are of this, what Leo talks about, this, this an anarchist moment. I'd say it's a transformative moment. I mean, we can come back and discuss that, but, but they're all people who were involved in Occupy, involved in an incredibly important campaign in Britain called UK Uncut, which changed public opinion. I mean, this is where there isn't necessarily a, an automatic conflict between movement struggle. There is a tension, movement initiatives and electoral politics. They took this whole scandal of, of tax avoidance, tax evasion, literally billions of pounds, uh, lost in, in tax and therefore, you know, a uh, key factor in the cuts of hospitals, libraries and so on. And they identified the people, they named the, the companies responsible and they then occupied these companies and they turned, these were companies with shop fronts in the main streets and they occupied them, turned them into hospitals, into libraries, you know, just for the day. And this completely changed public opinion so that an issue that was just the concern of a few nerdish academics and very, you know, brave MPs uh, meeting in a room of about sort of six people became an absolutely unstoppable sort of shift in public opinion. And even the Conservatives, even George Osborne, you know, had to promise to do something about tax evasion. So, you know, they were involved in these movements that were saying, we've got to, there's no more lobbying MPs and things. We've just got to take action. We've got to do something ourselves. We've got to take effectively transformative action. So I thought maybe I come myself just quickly from a, a tradition which we've termed in Britain in and against the state. So I feel I've always had this complicated. It's like having two, like doing the splits, you know, kind of wider and wider. But, um, you know, of being, I worked for the Greater London Council, a bit like Amelia worked for the council in municipality, in municipality in Athens. I worked for the, the municipality in, in London, which in the end, Mrs. Thatcher abolished. But as I'll mention later, was very involved with social movements, was a different kind of state. 
which is maybe why Thatcher abolished it. Uh, I've been studying experiences like the participatory budget in, in Porto Alegre and, and other kind of experiences where it's a matter of both popular power against the state, but at the same time, thinking and action about popular power um, it, to change the state, in the state. So I just thought we should think about, as a framing, I've hardly got any time left, but I won't be able to apply this framing, but a framing of this question in terms of you know, exploring the tension and conflict and relationship between, on the one hand, the logic of representation, or the logics of representation, the assumptions, imperatives, requirements involved in becoming elected to parliamentary institutions, and on the other hand, the uh, logics of building transformative power uh, in society. And, you know, there are clearly many differences and tensions. I mean, in the original movements for the vote, the suffragettes, the chartists, they had a notion that the vote was only the beginning. It would just open the institutions to what they, the way they put it, making present, literally, you know, re representing, representation was making present the struggles against social inequality, against exploitation. So this would be the beginnings of a sort of different dynamic. But the way that the British establishment, particularly, but many other ruling classes, responded to that, gradually put up more and more barriers, and the Labour Party was often complicit in this, to, to that kind of process of, of, of allowing, through the vote, that mass pressure, mass power to become in the state, part of the state. I, I can tell you lots of stories, but I won't, about Tony Benn and, and this. So, um, so you know, the, in the end, the, um, the, the process of representation has become completely narrow based on the idea of the citizen, not as embedded in social relations, struggling against those social relations, but as an abstract individual, uh, which leads to, in a way, the hiding of inequalities and the hiding of struggles. And so the question now is how we can, um, div in a way it's got a challenge, as, as Leo implied, to social movements and to social struggles to make themselves political. I think Theo earlier from Viome, or from Thessalonica anyway, um, talked about the importance of cooperatives being part of a, a militant alliance. And it's more how do we politicize the movements so they become part of a wider political alliance? And how do we open up political parties? How, we, how do we break their claim to a monopoly over political change, force them to recognize the, uh, the skills and capacities of movements, not just as people to, to draw into electoral politics, but actually to support. So the question, the equivalent question for Jeremy's campaign would not be, we will mobilize them, but you know, what are their capacities? What are the sources of power and transformation that we can support and give space to? So I'll end there. Thanks, sorry, Amelia.